Hello, I'm here for the next to last part of my uh, bookshelf tour. Um, this is going to be my non-fiction. Uh, this will probably be a longer video, much longer than the last one, just because I have a lot to say about non-fiction. Um, so, anyway, I'll get right to it. First is one of my favorite books ever, one of the books that has the biggest impact on the on just me and the way I think. Um, Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. Um, this is a this is one of the most important works in Stoic philosophy. Uh, a lot of a lot of quotes here. I I've fallen behind on it now, but I used to always um, take quotes from books like this that I read and uh, write them down in a binder. I still have the binder, um, but there were so many quotes from this that I pulled. Um, but the probably the two biggest teachings from this that I took away. One was that if an ordeal in life doesn't end up killing you, you can make it through. And if it does kill you, then that's okay, because you won't be alive to be worried about it anymore. Um, the second one was, was a quote that I have memorized, which is, uh, men exist for the sake of one another. Teach them, then, or bear with them. And... I don't know, I just, I just think that that's a great sentiment, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, um, educate other people, but, and if you can't or don't want to, then you should do your best to just live in, live in harmony with them. Um, anyway, yeah, that is a favorite. Next one is the one I'm currently working on. It's Bill Bryson's A Short History of Nearly Everything. Um, I have about 150 pages left of it. Uh, I definitely want to do a video about this. I am getting a lot of thoughts about it, and I actually feel I actually feel a bit act qualified to talk about this since I am a scientist, or at least studying to become a scientist. Um, so I'm gonna do a video about this where I sort of talk about I talk about the book, but also just talk about science in general um, and some of my thoughts on it and how it's thought about in our society and things like that. So I'm excited to do that. Um, Next is a book that was a bit of a disappointment, um, An Introduction to Shakespeare by, uh, Marchette Shoot. Not sure if I'm saying that right, but, um, uh, I, I was expecting, the back says, the back of this book says, When Shakespeare was alive, his plays were not art. Young people flocked to see them the way they go to movies and football games today. This book will show you why. And so I guess I was sort of expecting, uh, sort of long analysis of Shakespeare's plays. Um, and there's a little bit of that, which I enjoyed, but a lot of it is also just Shakespeare's life and times, um, the logistics of running a play at the time, and things like that, which aren't uninteresting, but weren't what I was looking for in this book. So, but it, it, to its merit, um, to its credit, this book did make me want to read more Shakespeare. Um, I've only read four Shakespeare plays, um, Othello, Macbeth, Romeo and Juliet, and Hamlet. Um, I think I need to reread all of those and then read the rest of his oeuvre. Um, but not, not sure when I'm gonna read all of Shakespeare. Um, but anyway. Next is a book I'm going to be reading once I'm done with A Short History of Nearly Everything. It's in two volumes, Robert Graves' The Greek Myths. Um, these are sort of short narratives of you know, Greek myths, of course, but they also have a uh, commentary on each myth. Um, and that's actually kind of what makes up the bulk of these two books. Um, and uh, so I'm really excited for that. I like that sort of thing. And um, also it gives you the source material for all of the myths. So if you want to go and really read the myths more in detail, because the actual description of the myths is, from what I've seen just by paging through this, are pretty short and uh, succinct, so if you really want an in-depth look at Greek mythology, you can find the sources here. And, um, so yeah, I don't know if I'll be doing a video on those yet, but maybe. Um, hopefully. Next is more Václav Havel. Um, but not, this is, um, here we go. A collection of essays called The Power of the Powerless. Um, I brought this mainly to read Václav Havel's own essay, which is also called The Power of the Powerless, um, which isn't that long. I haven't read it yet, 
I think I will read it though and do a video about it because it seems like a really interesting essay. It's um, very relevant to kind of what I study in psychology. I, I study kind of intergroup relations and inequality and racism and prejudice and uh, uh, kind of the way people perceive the government or society as fair versus what they perceive it as unfair. And I think the power of the powerless might have a lot of interesting things to say about that. So uh, I might do a video about that. Maybe I'll do like a joint video on the power of the powerless and um, the particular theory that I'm referring to when I talk about that. That might be cool. Yeah, I might do that. But anyway, this is here. Um, a lot of the other essays in here, though, are by other people, and they don't sound as interesting. There's like Catholicism and politics. Um, yeah, on not living in hatred. Actually, that one sounds good. <laughs> And that one also looks like it's like ten, only ten pages long, or something like that. Um, but then others like, who is really isolated? Like I don't know. I might, I might just kind of do an eclectic, or I might read this cover to cover. I don't know. Um, I'll need to think about that. Maybe I will. Who knows? Um, next is one that had a huge impact on me when I read it. Uh, Hiroshima by John Hershey. Uh, I had to read this in 11th grade, um, and yeah, just the description of the horror of that event really of stuck with me so much that, um, um, yeah, another book I need to reread. Seems to be a common theme here. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, uh, if you, yeah, I love this book. Well, love it. To the extent that you can love a book like this. Um, it's important to me, that is. Um, next is one that I just read this last year. Um, it's Essays in Idleness and the Hojoki by Kenko and Chome. So Kenko and Chome are two, were, were two, uh, Buddhist monks. And, um, so they both kind of just were these monks who kind of didn't have much to do. So they wrote these, uh, pieces, um... Kenko wrote Essays in Idleness, and Chome wrote Hojoki. So, um, Essays in Idleness are basically Kenko was sitting in his monastery during the Japanese Civil War, didn't know what to do, so he just sat and wrote, you know, whatever came to his mind. And, um, these are the essays. There's one that's only, like, two sentences. There's, you know, one that's, like, two paragraphs. So these are very short. The longest one is maybe two pages. Um, but they're just full of, full of, uh, nuggets of wisdom and other ideas that I'd had before that they, they, they just articulate, that he just articulates beautifully. Um, yeah, um, I can't, I'm not gonna find a, go through the, this whole thing and find a quote, but then Hojoki by, uh, Chome is kind of a, a very short memoir of him moving into a cabin alone, and basically it's a long meditation on, on transience, which is very important in Buddhism. Uh, and, you know, you're not going to find any mind-blowing ideas in in it, but you are going to, again, just experience beautiful articulations of important ideas, I think. Um, so I recommend that. Next is one I've held up before, um, A Reader's Guide to Samuel Beckett by Hugh Kenner. Uh, this is just all of Beckett's work, all of his novels, all of his plays. Um, and I assume his other work, uh, and just an introduction to each of them to help you understand, um, because as he says in his introduction, Beckett can be quite hard to get, um, but I, I, I definitely recommend this if you're reading him, uh, it really helped me get through his, his trilogy of novels, um, so, yeah, it's another one I got from my grandpa, uh, which also I got my copy of Hiroshima from my grandpa. And also The Greek Mist by Robert Graves I didn't get from my grandpa, but I got from his wife, who is my step-grandma, but who I always viewed as just a grandma. Um, and she gave those to me just before she died. Um, so yeah, it's good to finally be getting around to reading them. But next is uh, uh, The Way to Rainy Mountain by N. Scott Momaday. I just bought this yesterday at, um, at the, um, hold on a sec, at the Prairie Lights Bookstore in Iowa City, which is an 
excellent bookstore. It was a two-hour drive for me, but I thought it, it appeared on a on a list of the top 50 indie bookstores in the country, and uh, it was close enough that I was like, what the heck? And so I, I asked a friend if she wanted to come with me, and she did. And um, out of their entire selection, this is what I found that, this is a book I've been, that's been kind of swimming in my mind as something I should read. Um, and I just happened, they, ha they had like 10 copies there. It was weird. They have a used book section, um, which is nice if you're kind of, cheap like me. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so this is kind of a, a part memoir, part history of the Kiowa Indians, part kind of historical commentary on the Kiowa. I'm definitely going to be doing a video of this because I just finished reading it. You can read it in one sitting. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of pages are like that. Um, you know, so it's, yeah. Um, I'll be doing a video on that, so I'm gonna move on. Next is a bit of a, a, a one I, I didn't expect to find, I didn't even know existed, but it's um the book form of Toni Morrison's Nobel Lecture. Um, and you can read this in, I read it in 20 minutes, it's really short. Um, you know, you can see how short it is. And you can also see I underlined and starred up the wazoo on this thing. Um, you know, it's basically just a, polemic about the importance of language and how language can be used to oppress groups and how language can be used to understand groups and how language can help groups to liberate themselves, kind of, um, and to assert their uh, cultural independence and the value of their culture. And yeah, it's beautifully written. Um, if you don't want to read this, I re recommend um, Toni Morrison's Nobel Lecture, li I recommend listening to her Nobel Lecture, which is on YouTube, I believe. Um, yeah. Next is a book that, when I read it, it totally blew my mind. Um, this man's ideas have sort of swum in my head, and maybe I've grown a bit disillusioned with some of them in the meantime, but it's Thus Spoke Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche. Um, yeah, the, the whole... The whole idea of creating your own worldview, constantly questioning the prevailing morals of society, um, and things like that, I think that's really what struck me, but since then some of Nietzsche's ideas have, I, I, I have seen the kind of um, harm that they can do, like, um, well, I'm paraphrasing myself, but he said at one point something like, you know, you need to know when to help a friend and bring a friend into your house and um, give him food and warmth and you need to know when to slam the door on him and just let him deal with his own problems and I guess that's a good sentiment in theory but I feel like it's kind of a slippery slope to a kind of Ayn Randian libertarianism which I have a lot of problems with um, so I don't know um, I, wa I do want to read more of Nietzsche's work I want to read Beyond Good and Evil um, at least beyond good and evil. I also read On the Genealogy of Morals a year, year or two ago, and it was okay. I was sort of like, I, let, like, my thoughts on that were, you know, is any of this even historically accurate? You know, um, but yeah, so this is still here because it's important to me and because I might reread it at some point. 